Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Helios Airways of Cyprus. Helios Airways Limited was founded on September 23rd, 1998 and was named after the ancient Greek god of the sun. Helios would also be headquartered in Limassol, Cyprus. The company was to be the first privately owned airline in the country as the Cypriot skies began to open up ahead of their planned entry into the European Union. Helios was to be backed by a mix of Cypriot and Swiss investors. As the country's first privately owned airline, several Cypriot travel companies were keen to invest in the new venture. Marcus Seeler took position of chief executive. He was formerly the head of TEA Switzerland, a Swiss leisure airline which had outlived the Trans-European Airways collection of carriers until it was taken over and is now known as EasyJet Switzerland. Some former managers from TEA Switzerland were brought in, as were a few from TEA Cyprus, a former aircraft wet lease operator. With its management team in place along with its financial backing, Helios Airways publicly launched in October 1999. The airline revealed its planned start for May 2000, just in time for the busy summer holiday season. Helios planned to initially operate leisure flights for various travel companies, ferrying holidaymakers to Cyprus and had selected the Boeing 737 to form the backbone of their fleet. The airline planned to begin with a single second-hand 737-400, but then bring in brand new 737-800 next generation aircraft. In November 1999 the company established Helios Airways UK. Despite the name, they wouldn't operate any flights and instead be used for marketing and administrative services to its Cypriot parents. Helios would also establish its own car rental company based in Cyprus, a clever little bit of diversification which might bring in extra revenue from arriving tourists. The airline took delivery of its first aircraft in the spring of 2000, a 10-year-old Boeing 737-400 which was leased from GE Capital. The Helios livery was, in my opinion, rather smart. While the fuselage was predominantly white with large golden Helios titles, the tail and rear portion of the aircraft wore blue with the tail featuring an image of the god Helios himself on a sovereign. It was very distinctive and sadly would be remembered for the wrong reasons. On Monday the 15th of May 2000, Helios Airways took to the skies when it operated its first passenger flight between Larnaca and London Gatwick. With the airline operating on behalf of several tour operators, its 737 visited a myriad of destinations during the airline's first summer. Glasgow, Edinburgh and Manchester in the UK saw service along with Basel in Switzerland. As part of the liberalisation of the Cypriot aviation industry ahead of Cyprus joining the EU, Helios was awarded the rights to operate several scheduled air routes to go along with their growing charter network. Helios would be awarded the rights to fly to Belfast, Dublin and Sofia, but it would still be some time before they were allowed to take on the state-owned Cyprus Airways on the lucrative routes to London Heathrow. The Libra Holidays Group, a large Cypriot travel company which had owned the UK-based Libra Holidays tour operator, already owned a small stake in Helios. However, they established a holding company, Libra Aviation Cyprus, in January 2000. Through this holding company, Libra would acquire a one-third stake in the British charter airline, Sabre Airways. Sabre were an independent airline operating charter flights for various travel companies without being tied to a particular one. They had been operating a number of flights either on behalf of Libra or selling them seats on existing flights. Sabre had been operating a fleet of old Boeing 727 Trijets and 737-200s, however, they had become one of the first European airlines to introduce the next generation Boeing 737-800. In November, Libra Aviation acquired a further third of Sabre, giving them a controlling stake in the company. Libra then announced its intention to rebrand the airline as XL Airways during the winter. Libra had clearly been thinking ahead, as they had already established a Cypriot shell company, XL Airways Cyprus, a few months earlier that July. A few months later, in April 2001, Libra would buy the remaining shares in XL and acquire the company outright. Libra wanted to use Excel to help Helios introduce their own shiny new 737-800s in the spring of 2001. March 2001 would see Helios take delivery of their first Boeing 737-800. Five Bravo Delta Bravo Hotel was named Zela, perhaps after the ancient battle of Zela between Julius Caesar and Phanases II of the Kingdom of Pontus in what is now modern-day Turkey. 
Their second aircraft arrived a month later, with five Bravo Delta Bravo India arriving in late April and would be named Benny, though I doubt that was after the guy from ABBA. Rubbish joke aside, it was actually named Benny on one side and Venny on the other. Following the introduction of both 737-800s, the airline's sole 737-400 was phased out in June, with the aircraft moving on to Malev in Hungary. Operating from both Larnaca and Paphos, the two 737-800s operated a mix of scheduled and charter routes for Helios. Over the summer of 2001 they visited new destinations including Aberdeen, Amsterdam, Birmingham, Budapest, Dublin and Zurich. Helios didn't fall into the trap of rapid expansion. To be fair, the company wasn't in the greatest of financial shape, but that doesn't stop some young airlines from leasing as many aircraft as it can. Instead, Helios kept things steady with its two 737s and would try to get the most out of them by squeezing in some new destinations. Warsaw in Poland would see service during the summer of 2002, and in 2003 Helios added Brussels, Newcastle, London Luton and Sofia to their expanding route network. With more routes lined up, Helios would need more aircraft. The 737-800 was in high demand, so Helios instead opted to peruse the second-hand aircraft market. Helios found a Boeing 737-300 that was becoming available from DBA, formerly known as Deutsche BA. The aircraft was delivered to Helios in April 2004. Registered 5 Bravo Delta Bravo Yankee, it would have 136 economy seats and be named Olympia. April 2004 would also see Helios finally be able to go head-to-head -head with the quasi-state-owned Cyprus Airways, with a daily flight from Larnaca to London Heathrow. The following month, scheduled services would begin to Athens, Thessaloniki and Heraklion. Helios also formed a partnership with Aegean Airlines. The two airlines would offer code shares on a number of routes, with Helios benefiting greatly thanks to Aegean offering onward connections from Athens. Helios offered two standards of service. When flying scheduled routes, passengers will be offered complimentary drinks and snacks as well as a meal. On charter services, the drinks and snacks were chargeable. Meals, however, were included on charter flights as this was one thrill that the traditional charter airlines hadn't started axing just yet. On the 12th of October 2004, it was announced that Libra Holidays had acquired Helios Airways. Rather oddly, Libra had just offloaded its UK charter airline, XL Airways, to Air Atlanta Icelandic. Following the sale of XL, Libra were able to focus their attention on Helios, developing a larger route network and hopefully becoming bigger and stronger than the competing Cypriot leisure airline, the state-owned Eurocypria. Warsaw had already seen charter services, however a once per week scheduled flight would operate from November. It would increase to twice per week during the following summer season. Birmingham would join Helios's growing scheduled route network the following month on December the 20th. 2005 looked promising for Helios. The airline was operating charter flights to Bristol, Humberside and Newcastle in the UK, Christianstad in Norway, Stockholm in Sweden, Amsterdam in the Netherlands and Cairo in Egypt. Their scheduled route network consisted of three London airports, Luton, Gatwick and Heathrow. Manchester, Birmingham, Dublin, Athens, Sofia, Warsaw and Thessaloniki all saw either scheduled or charter services too. A fourth London airport, Stansted, would see service later in the year. Helios was also looking at more destinations with Paris, Strasbourg, Cania and Bucharest all on the cards. March 2005 saw the introduction of a scheduled service from Larnaca to Prague. The flight would operate four times per week en route via Athens. The following month, in April, flights began to Strasbourg, giving Helios its entry into the French market. With so many new routes either starting up or lined up, Helios was in need of more aircraft. They had been looking at bringing in another XDBA 737-300, however, in the interim they hired in an Airbus A319 from Lotus Air of Egypt. The Airbus arrived in early May, ready for the busy summer season. The summer season was in full swing when on Sunday the 14th of August 2005 tragedy would strike. Helios Airways Flight 522 operating from Larnaca to Prague via Athens crashed on a mountainside on the outskirts of Athens with the loss of all 121 people on board. 
The Boeing 737-300 had departed Larnaca at 9.07, a few minutes behind schedule. Shortly after takeoff, the pilots had reported an air conditioning problem and then nothing more was heard from them. The aircraft continued to climb to its assigned altitude of 34,000 feet and follow its pre-planned route. After flying on for nearly two hours, the aircraft was intercepted by two F-16s from the Hellenic Air Force. The two fighter jets had been scrambled to investigate why nobody on board the aircraft had communicated with air traffic control as it had continued on into Greek airspace. By now the aircraft was circling in a holding pattern over the Greek mainland, seemingly waiting to be allowed to land in Athens, but nobody on board was talking. Upon intercepting the jetliner, the fighter pilots reported that they saw oxygen masks deployed in the cabin and that the first officer was slumped at the controls while the captain's seat was empty. While they continued to fly alongside the Boeing, they saw a figure enter the cockpit and sit in the captain's seat. The man, later identified as flight attendant Andreas Padromu, waved at the fighter jets and prepared to take control of the aircraft. He had been able to remain conscious during the decompression event through the use of a portable crew oxygen cylinder. Padromu, like a number of flight attendants, had aspired to be an airline pilot. In fact, he was already a qualified pilot and was simply working at Helios as cabin crew whilst trying to find work as a pilot. He had already held several pilot's licenses, including his PPL, IFR and commercial pilot's license, but had not been trained to fly anything as big or as complex as the Boeing 737. Despite this, he was prepared to give it his best shot. Unfortunately, he never got his chance, as moments after taking the left seat, the aircraft's left engine shut down. The aircraft had been doing circuits in the holding pattern for nearly 70 minutes and had finally exhausted its fuel supply. With the left engine shut down, the autopilot disengaged and Padromu had to try and hand fly the Boeing as it began to descend. He made five mayday calls which went unanswered as unbeknownst to him, the aircraft's radios were still tuned to Larnaca so his calls wouldn't be heard until the cockpit voice recorder was played back later. The right hand engine shut down 10 minutes after the left and 4 minutes after that the Boeing crashed into the mountains some 25 miles from Athens after Padromu had turned the aircraft away from the city in an effort to avoid ground casualties. An aircraft accident is always bad for an airline, especially with loss of life, however the investigation into Flight 522 was damning for Helios. Over the coming days and weeks more information came to light. The aircraft in question, 5 Bravo Delta Bravo Yankee, had a history of pressurisation problems including a rapid loss of cabin pressure on a flight several months earlier. It was revealed that when the aircraft had arrived in Salonika earlier on the day of the crash, the crew had reported problems with a cabin door seal as well as concerning noises from the same door. The investigation would discover that when an engineer investigated the reported problems, he set the aircraft's pressurisation system to manual, but failed to return it to auto when he had finished and cleared the aircraft for service. The pilots of Flight 522 failed to notice the incorrect setting and departed. As the aircraft climbed, the air pressure in the cabin decreased. The aircraft tried to warn the pilots, first with the cabin altitude warning horn. However, the same sound was used for takeoff configuration warnings, and despite the 737 already being airborne, the pilots believed that it was a takeoff config warning and allowed themselves to become preoccupied with that, missing the other key warnings which followed. When the aircraft passed through 18,000 feet, the oxygen mass deployed in the passenger cabin and the relevant warning light came on in the cockpit, however this was missed. The cabin altitude gauge would have easily shown that the cabin was not pressurised, but this too was missed. Hypoxia set in and confused the crew further until it was too late and they passed out. In the immediate aftermath of the crash, Helios issued several statements. The airline would continue to operate its flying program, albeit with some delays, and its remaining aircraft would undergo safety inspections to put the public at ease. The two 737-800s were sent to Stockholm where engineers from SAS, Scandinavian Airlines, would give them a thorough checking over. Both aircraft were cleared for service and returned to Cyprus, however it was clear that public perception of the airline had gone south. 
Just under three months after the crash of Flight 522, the Helios Airways livery was dropped. The airline's management had evidently understood that the livery would be forever associated with images of the aircraft wreckage, almost drawing parallels between the crash of Helios Flight 522 and Air Florida Flight 90. Both of the remaining aircraft would see repaints. Five Bravo Delta Bravo India would have a white fuselage and blank white tail, fly Helios.com titles and grey engines. Five Bravo Delta Bravo Hotel, however, would be painted in XL Airways livery, albeit without the XL branding, and instead sport FlyHelios.com titles. The company website also underwent a rebranding. The Helios logo was dropped and they stopped updating their news page. Instead, the final news article was from the end of August and went at great lengths to explain in both Greek and English that their two remaining aircraft were safe. The winter season would see Helios offer scheduled flights from Larnaca to Birmingham, Manchester, London Heathrow, Luton and Warsaw. Paphos would see scheduled flights to Dublin, London Heathrow, Gatwick, Luton and Manchester. It would be a long winter for Helios and ahead of the summer the airline would announce a rebranding. On March the 14th 2006, Libra Holidays announced that they would be launching a new airline to replace Helios Airways. Citing the troubles experienced in the wake of the crash of Flight 522, Libra announced the new A-Jet Airways which would take over the operations of Helios. They also announced that unlike Helios, A-Jet would only offer charter flights. However, by the time the company website went live a few days later, they were offering a variety of scheduled services. Things were moving quickly as just days later, on the 18th of March 2006, the first of the two former Helios aircraft had been painted in the new A-Jet livery. The new livery looked quite smart. It was a blue and white affair, with blue stripes wisping along the lower fuselage, up and over the wings, and up towards the tail. The blue and white stripes leading up to the tail took some inspiration from the current flag of Greece. Incidentally, the original Greek flag was created in Skiaphos, a place I hold close to my heart. Let's not get distracted though. The tail was painted blue and featured the company logo, the Greek letter for Alpha, which naturally caused some confusion over the name of the airline. Was it A-Jet or Alpha-Jet? Just one of the ex-Helios aircraft, the former Zela, would get painted in this new livery. The other aircraft, 5 Bravo Delta Bravo Hotel, which had been wearing an unbranded XL livery, would also transfer over to Ajet from Helios, however, it wouldn't stick around for long. In mid-May it would be picked up by XL Airways and move on to the British Register. Ajet weren't downsizing though. The day after Bravo Hotel's departure, a shiny new 737-800 arrived from the Boeing factory in Seattle. This aircraft, registered 5 Bravo Delta Charlie Echo, would be equipped with winglets, which at the time was an optional extra rather than something seen as standard. The Airbus A319, which had been hired in from Lotus Air, had been returned in April, with Ajet opting to bring its flying program fully in-house. Ajet plodded on through the busy summer season, but it had become apparent that even with a new name and new livery, the company was feeling the negative publicity from the crash of Helios 522. On the 30th of October 2006, with rumours about the airline's future mounting, Ajet announced that they would wind down operations over the winter period and that Libra Holidays would transfer its flying programme over to XL Airways, who would base an aircraft in Cyprus to operate on their behalf. Naturally, this news didn't go down particularly well with either the airline's creditors nor the Cypriot government. The latter demanded immediate payment of all back taxes and the airline's creditors, the catering companies, ground handling firms, fuel companies etc. all demanded cash payments for any new goods or services rendered to the airline. Having shot themselves in the foot, but not quite as spectacularly as when Canada 3000 did it years earlier, Ajet were forced to announce the following day, on October 31st, that they were ceasing operations immediately. With Ajet's fleet grounded, XL Airways quickly sprung into action and operated flights on Ajet's behalf from November the 1st. This isn't quite the end of the story, however. Several days later, the company announced on its website that the government of the Republic of Cyprus had illegally detained Ajet's aircraft and frozen the company's bank accounts, which was in direct contravention to the successful appeal lodged by Ajet in the district court, causing substantial financial damage to the company. 
A result of this was that Ajax wasn't able to charter aircraft from other carriers and thus completely ceased operations. Excel would, however, continue to operate a flying program on behalf of Libra Holidays. Excel would in fact pick up one of the two grounded 737s, with the British charter carrier acquiring the still new 5 Bravo Delta Charlie Echo and re-registering it as Golf Oscar X-Ray Lima Charlie. Incidentally, this was my last ever winning aircraft that I scored as cabin crew, ironically bagging the aircraft on what turned out to be my penultimate day as cabin crew due to Excel Airways collapsing the following night. That's a completely different story however, but the link's on screen if you're interested. Excel Airways, which itself had just had a rebrand, would establish a year-round base in Cyprus following the demise of Ajet, until Excel met its own demise in September 2008, but that painful story has already been told. So, what went wrong? Well, the obvious answer is the crash of Helios 522 for several reasons. Helios was a very small airline, both in terms of the fleet and crewing. The loss of one aircraft will greatly affect the scheduling, either forcing flights to be cut or requiring costly charters. The loss of the crew would of course greatly impact the morale of the employees. With an airline like Helios, everyone knew everyone. Cyprus itself is a very close-knit country, with it seeming like everyone on the island personally knew someone on board the doomed flight. In fact, on the day of the crash, I returned home to Bristol following a flight to Zakynthos to find my Cypriot housemate rushing out to London for a flight home. He was close friends with Andreas Prodromu, the pilot turned cabin crew turned pilot who heroically tried to save the plane. The images of the wreckage from Helios 522 prominently feature the aircraft's tail section, with the logo visible for all to see. It had been on the front pages of newspapers all around the world, especially so given the unusual and, at the time, unknown circumstances of the crash. It was just like the crash of Air Florida Flight 90 over two decades earlier, where the tail section of the ill-fated 737 was poking out of the Potomac River for all to see. It would be an image that haunted the airline. Unlike Air Florida, however, it was the beginning of the end for Helios. As a leisure airline which predominantly carried holidaymakers, image was extra important. Unlike businessmen, most holidaymakers may only fly once or twice per year and thus be extra nervous about the whole experience. They certainly couldn't be blamed if they told their travel agent they'd rather not fly on Helios. The rebrand to Ajax should have worked, but it just couldn't shake the ghost of Flight 522 and the continuing investigation into both the crash and the airline. Several years after the demise of both Helios and Ajax, several of the airline's managers were sentenced to prison for manslaughter. Just imagine if Ajax had still been trying to operate during that legal case. In the end though, Ajet wouldn't have made it. Its parent company, Libra Holidays, collapsed in December 2009 with debts of over £40 million. Libra, the trading name of Albury Travel, was eventually liquidated in 2015. Remarkably, however, Ajet still exists due to the still ongoing legal fight over Helios 522. The company itself is now just a dormant company and another twist in the tale of Flight 522. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry. I've got a contact form on my website and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I have plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.